Hey everybody, just want to make sure you can hear me today. Yeah, good, awesome, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming out today. Uh, looking forward to having a discussion with you. My name is Steve Vincic, uh, product manager responsible for our identity center products within AWS. And um, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Jamal Borkba, DJ, I'm global solution architect in automotive industry. And uh, today uh, we are going to uh, look into building identity and access management into AWS at scale in uh, an efficient and resilient way. So let's get started. So in terms of agenda, what we get, we're gonna first start by setting the stage of which identity topic we're gonna talk about. So identity is a broad topic. So what kind of identity type is this session gonna be about? And after that, we're gonna see different options for you to bring your enterprise identity into AWS. And as you scale, what are the different uh, access and delegation models available for you? And we will conclude by uh, planning your uh, disaster recovery and resiliency for your identity solution. So I am identity and access management, and here I'm talking about the topic, not the AWS service. Uh, at the end of the day, it is actually uh, controlling who is accessing to what under which circumstances. However, the way you handle it might be slightly different depending on the type of identity. And here we distinguish two types of identities. The workforce identity, which is basically uh, your employees, maybe your partners accessing AWS resources, services, workloads, and your own customer's identity and access management. And that falls into, for instance, mobile or web application that you are developing and that your own customers are gonna access in order to consume business. And this last category, usually the AWS service is gonna leverage in order to uh, deal with it is Amazon Cognito. And for the other one, it's AWS IAM Identity Center. And our focus is gonna be here uh, for this session. And just before moving on, quick poll to the audience. Uh, I was mentioning the IEM Identity Center. How many of you are familiar with this uh, service? Does it sound uh, familiar? Raise your hand. Yeah, 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 yeah. Half, 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 almost. So yeah, it seems that more, a bit of you has followed the recent announcement. And that. Great, thanks, DJ. Yes, yeah, so we had a recent announcement of a name change uh, from what was previously known as uh, SSO or single sign-on, AWS single sign-on. We've renamed to AWS IAM Identity Center. Uh, with the focus on identity there, we have it named twice, but the importance behind it is that Identity Center is really a foundation that's uh, built on top of IAM. The other aspect of it is SSO really didn't uh, describe what the features are of the service today. Initially, when we launched it in 2017, it, it, it kind of really was truly just a, a basic SSO solution. Uh, now we've added a number of features over the years and capabilities, and we really wanted to, to kind of demonstrate what that is with the name change. Um, one of the big things uh, that I do want to call out, because we have had a, a number of folks ask us, is there are no API changes, no technical changes to what SSO was. It's really uh, more of a focus on a name change and on kind of some of the new capabilities we've just recently introduced as well that we'll talk about today uh, and some of the new things that we have coming on with the product as well. The console itself, minor, minor changes to it just to improve usability from a console perspective. Uh, the new console name, so I am Identity Center, you'll see that in the console as well as the service name itself. And just a couple reasons why we're doing it. So one, Identity Center is a place to centrally manage your human identities within AWS. Uh, it's also the central place for you to be able to manage applications uh, and application assignments within AWS, and also the ability to uh, have multi-account permissions. So within I am Identity Center, the ability to actually uh, assign users to multiple accounts at once. The other part is freedom to choose, and that's around different identity providers. So most of you have uh, your own identity provider today, and we do some uh, options for federation into IAM Identity Center. And so there are a couple different federation options today. One uh, is with IAM Identity Center that we'll talk about a little bit more. 
And then the other is more traditional with just directly into IAM. And we've had that because it predated uh, Identity Center coming on board. Uh, but there's also some specific reasons why you may need to use uh, Federation into IAM directly. A uh, couple of things though, it's on a per account basis. So as you're kind of, you know, again, thinking back to when we first started with it, uh, you're probably starting out with one, two, 10 accounts, but as your account strategy has grown, now you have hundreds, even thousands of accounts. So the idea of, of having to federate into each of those accounts uh, becomes pretty daunting over time. But with Identity Center, you're able to federate into multiple accounts at once. You only have to federate into Identity Center and you can distribute that out to all the accounts within your organization. And so it really is the recommended way that we talk about it from a new setup. So if you have, if you're new to AWS or just getting started in the environment, uh, we recommend uh, Identity Center is, is the place where you centrally manage your users uh, and, and groups and identities. For IAM specifically, there's, uh, we're recommending two things, right? It's gonna take time to migrate some of those users over. So we do recommend that you get started with Identity Center now. You can have both going, so you could federate into both actually. Uh, and then you can work on a migration strategy over time to migrate those users uh, that are in IAM and get rid of those long-term credentials and use more short-term credentials that are available uh, for users that you have set up in Identity Center. DJ? All right, let's go now a little bit and see how uh, is uh, the uh, flow for when you are federating the identities through uh, IAM external identities. So we are not talking about IAM uh, identity center here. We are talking about uh, IAM uh, external federation. Uh, so basically the user starts connecting to the uh, IDP portal. Uh, from there, he's gonna be authenticated against the identity source typically Active Directory. Uh, once the authentication is successful, a SAML assertion is gonna be issued and the users get, get back to the, uh, uh, to the user and the user gets redirected to AWS SDS, where AWS SDS is gonna validate the SAML assertion, exchange it into uh, AWS temporary credentials and get, the, get it back to the users and redirect him into the AWS console. A lot of that stuff is happening automatically, fortunately, for the user. So basically, from a user perspective, he starts on the IDP portal, he ends up into the AWS console. In terms of configuration, you're going to establish the SAML trust between the identity provider and AWS by configuring the SAML metadata of the IDP into AWS and vice versa. And secondly, you're going to configure the mapping between the groups and actually the effective roles that the user is going to assume into AWS. And that's done through a SAML attribute. Now with that said, you can figure out that at scale, if you suppose that you have a user that has multiple access, you might be limited by the length of the attribute, SAML attribute itself, right? That's first. Uh, secondly, in terms of figuring out who is accessing what, you need actually to look at the roles that are configured on AWS side in order to figure out what are the effective access that you are granting to the users. But look at also the mapping that you have configured on the IDP side as well. Uh, so getting a full audit of your access management requires you to look up a two source of information that usually are handled by different teams, namely the uh, cloud admin teams and the identity team. So, what are you gonna do about it? <laughs> we'll switch again. Uh, so how this actually works within uh, I Am Identity Center. And so from an identity store perspective or identity provider, um, there's a number of integrations that we already have with uh, six different identity providers out there uh, that you could use today. Uh, so those are SAML integrations. You can also bring your own um, if they're not on that list and do the integration yourself with, with, uh, with a SAML and SKIM integration. Um, just gotta be careful around some of the other IDPs out there may not apply, adhere to the standard exactly the same way that, that we have it formatted. And so you'll just have to kind of be careful as you're configuring that. Uh, and then the other way to do it is actually natively within AWS and within Identity Center, uh, there's a directory store option. So you can actually create your users and groups within that environment if you didn't have an IDP or if for some reason you just wanted to be able to um, have your users directly into the AWS Identity Store. 
And from that place, uh, it's really one central location for you to manage uh, workforce identities within AWS. Uh, and then it gives you options, right? Uh, you can assign multi-account permissions uh, or, and you can do application assignments. And so it's not uh, something that they're both mutually exclusive, meaning you don't have to do both. You can do just one or the other. So I could just assign my users uh, to applications and roles in applications or uh, assign them to multiple accounts as well. So kind of how it actually works uh, from an IDP configuration perspective, uh, is you'll con configure the Reliant Party, which is AWS Identity Center. Uh, that's uh, what you configure in the identity provider. And then IDP that, that you already have, you're gonna set up your groups, uh, you'll add users to those groups, and then you'll configure skin provisioning. What that'll do is allow you to have automatic synchronization between your on-prem or hybrid identity provider and AWS uh, identity. And so on the identity uh, source side for AWS, you'll select external IDP. And we do this all on the console for a setup uh, of your IDP because this is really something you should only have to do once. So we don't have APIs where you can script this part, uh, but it's something that just, it, it's, it's a kind of a better user experience from the console itself because it's only a one-time thing. Enable automatic provisioning, so you'll get those real-time updates synced back and forth on users and, and groups and attributes. And then from there, that's where you can create permission sets uh, and assign users to those permission sets. So what are permission sets? Uh, permission sets in simple words are a collection of permissions and uh, actually policies uh, that you define and that you assign to a group or users and that are uh, actually tightened to uh, specific AWS target accounts. Uh, the definition itself sounds a little bit familiar with AWS role, with the exception made that you have also an element of configuring the target AWS account. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is that behind the scenes, I, uh, AWS IAM Identity Center, what it's going to do is going to automatically provision for you immutable IAM roles in the target account that you have configured, and that's going to be assumed by the user that you have assigned it to the permission set itself. And in terms of uh, policies, you can have AWS managed policies uh, assigned to uh, the uh, permission set. And for those that has been using formerly AWS SSO, uh, it has been announced a few weeks ago and it's finally there. Now you can also put customer managed policies. I know that it has been a long way to feature, but it's finally there. And you can attach one permission boundary and one inline policy. And you can have up to 20 uh, policies in total. Uh, you can have a mix like uh, 10 managed policies and 10 customer managed policies. Uh, just bear in mind, uh, if you remember the way permission sets works is by propagating AWS roles into the target account. Uh, AWS roles out of the box are limited up to 10 policies. So if you intend to use the full 20 policies with the permission set, bear in mind to increase the limit of your IEM roles to support the 20. Uh, policies in the target accounts. What about uh, other integrated services? Uh, and one of the, the examples that I'd like uh, to mention is actually, for instance, Amazon Grafana, which is our uh, managed services for Grafana. And suppose that we have a business user, they want to grant access to some uh, business report dashboard in Grafana. However, without granting him the full access into the AWS console. So you have that capability through what we call integrated apps. And those are uh, AWS services that where you can actually uh, enable uh, SSO authentication and authorization, uh, usually through a single click of button, uh, as you can see in the screenshot, and actually extend and use AWS SSO as a way uh, to uh, do your authentication and authorization in those integrated apps as well. Uh, I mentioned Amazon Grafana. There are other couple of services, such uh, Amazon SageMaker, AWS IoT SafeWise, where you have this option as well. What about other applications? Well, for the uh, other application, if they are SAML based, you can also integrate them with AWS SSO, and we have two possibilities. We have kind of pre-configured applications. Those could be third-party applications, 
from Office 365, Salesforce, Box, uh, to name very few. Or you can also use a custom SAML configuration that uh, you are putting into AWS SSO. And actually, it could be also useful for AWS services themselves. And in the example that I'm giving here is I want to actually, I have uh, my call center agent, and I have my Amazon Connect instance, and I want to be able to leverage AWS SSO in order to grant access to my uh, call center agent into the specific Amazon Connect agent without going through the whole AWS access or AWS console access. That's achievable through a specific SAML field that is highlighted here. It's called relay state. And you can, right after the authentication, redirect the user directly to the right Amazon uh, Connect instance and get uh, actually uh, connected to the Amazon Connect console without uh, figuring out which service in the console the user should go through. The rest of it is quite classical, I would say, SAML configuration in terms of attribute map mapping. You will configure the mapping to the user ID attribute, and you will configure actually the mapping to the role that's going to be assumed, and that's going to grant access to the Amazon Connect instance in our example. So next thing we want to talk about is how you scale these permissions out. So right, you're, you're in an enterprise environment. You have hundreds, tens of thousands of users, uh, tens of thousands of even applications, potentially. And so how do you manage and scale permissions to a multi-count environment in that perspective? Well, typically, kind of traditionally, is more of an RBAC-based approach, right? So this is a NIST kind of standard that came out probably a good 20 years ago. Um, where it's fairly simple, right? It's you get a user assigned to a group or a role, and they get to access resources that uh, are part of that role, right? So think of like the accounting person, uh, they're ass assigned to the finance role, they're able to access all the files in the finance system. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward in a real small organization, and you could probably manage it from that perspective. But as you start to think about how complex it gets, uh, especially in a dynamic environment where you have users hopping on to different projects all the time. They need to be able to access the data when they need to access. They don't want to have to go through a lot of steps to get approval to get access to resources. And then trying to manage that uh, effectively and efficiently is really, really hard, especially when you're thinking about least privilege and being able to take those access uh, back from that user. So what we've, we've seen from there then is really a scalable permissions model that's based on attributes. Yeah, and the way I like to, again, in very simple terms, I like to define uh, the ABAC uh, attribute-based access control uh, model is basically rule that grant access that are based on attributes of uh, the subject, so namely the users, and the object, the resources that you want to grant the access to, right? And the reason why it's kind of a uh, more scalable uh, mechanism is that if you think about it, and if uh, we you pick an example of a user working on project A. So basically, uh, the user has an attribute saying, his project A, working on project A. And then you have the different set of resources that have exactly the same attribute, the matching attribute, let's say project A as well. Uh, so the, uh, by defining one policy that says, if the project attribute is matching the resource attribute, then the access is granted. With a single policy, you can actually grant multiple access potentially, right? Uh, it could be the same thing for project B, project C, and so on and so forth. And also, if you think about it, uh, if you have that um, through that attribute-based access, uh, if tomorrow project A evolves and require new resources, so basically if those new resources have the right attributes, the access is granted automatically. And in terms of audit, well, you audit may need attributes because those are granting the access. Now, with that said, don't get me wrong. It's not the magical solution that's going to overcome all your problems. Uh, reality is it has implications. It has implications on the technical level. Well, it needs the requirement that actually your resources do support that attribute uh, possibility. That's one. And the second one that I find out the most unforeseen, uh, I would say, um, uh, challenge uh, is organizational. It's like you need to think about what are the attributes that you're going to 
base your control uh, access control on it, right? You need careful designing and thinking about them. Do they reflect into your organization? Like I mentioned the project, but that not, might not be relevant to your organization. So what are those attributes, right? And secondly, now we are deporting the access into the attributes. So it needs to carefully plan and uh, actually figure out who is accessing those attributes? How do you provision those attributes? And more is more importantly, how do you deprovision those attributes? So if tomorrow I'm not working on project A anymore, it needs to be an automatic workflow within my organization that automatically remove that attribute because otherwise I will be still carrying the access even if I left the project. So it's really important from an organizational perspective as well to carefully think about it. And the reality is that you will end up doing both. Uh, a little bit of airbag and a little bit of airbag because that still actually give you some uh, flexibility. And don't, start, don't try to boil the ocean. Start with small uh, use cases. Uh, one of them that I've been working recently with one of my customers with is that they wanted to ensure actually access to um, resources that carry confidential data through airbag. So basically we just define simple tag that says confidential. Whatever the resource is tagged with confidential, it means that it carries confidential data and only users that carries that tag could actually do it. And we link it back to the HR process during the provisioning of the identity to figure out every time only validated users could carry that tag. And if they are not part of it anymore, the attribute get deprovisioned automatically. And here are uh, some of the uh, common, uh, I would say, other few examples. Uh, the one that I like also as well is like, if you're having actually, if you are uh, putting the attribute on the resources on uh, who owns them or which teams owns them as well, uh, where you can easily say, whatever uh, resource, uh, the, the, whatever resource it should have an owner uh, attribute. And every time the uh, owner attribute is matching the user, then the access is automatically granted. Great, thanks, DJ. Uh, and so just a little bit more about attributes. Um, they're actually what we refer to as tags on AWS. So as you tag your resources, you can tag your users and identity center as well. Uh, and it's that key and key value pair that assigns uh, the kind of the ABAC function there for you. So usually they're used for things like cost attribution, discovery, and uh, also can be used for access control. And so if we look at it, kind of a simple example here uh, for session tags, this is with Secrets Manager. And basically what we're saying in this policy is that a resource tag and that project and the principal tag and that project have to match in order for that particular principal, that user to be able to uh, do have full access to Secrets Manager for that, for that account. The next topic we want to talk about is permission delegation. And I want to talk about there's, there's really two delegation things that we have within uh, Identity Center. Uh, so this one's focused on permission delegation, but we also just recently announced uh, a delegated admin feature. So we did this back on May uh, 12th uh, of this year, and it allows for a delegated admin function into a separate account outside the management account. Uh, and, and so I'll talk a little bit about that, but then we'll dive into permission management some more. So uh, if you think about how we structure our accounts within AWS, obviously organizations is the best practice around that. In order to run Identity Center, you have to have organization running. Uh, you run Identity Center within the management account of that organization. And then with delegated admin, you can identify another account that can act as a, have delegated privileges to manage that instance of Identity Center. But when we talk about delegated permissions, we look at it, uh, this is a little bit different. So this is allows me to set up permission assignments for users. So let's say uh, it's a, a, a database user. Uh, they know who they need to have access to that database. We can allow them limited access to only uh, add users or groups into uh, their application by this policy. And so here they can do it for specific accounts uh, and they can set up permission assignments as well. We can also limit it down even further. So if we look at the next one here, we can actually limit it down to a permission set itself. So now this uh, dele delegated user can only 
apply that permission set to those accounts. And another delegation, I would say, uh, possibility within AWS are permission boundaries. Uh, so permission boundaries are uh, actually uh, designed uh, the, uh, in order to limit the permission on IEM principles, such an AWS IEM role. Uh, such it doesn't exceed what uh, the permission was uh, initially intended, right? Uh, you need to remember that permission boundaries in its an IEM managed policy. So it means that we have a limit of 6,145 characters. And for a role, you can attach only one permission boundary at a time. Now, with that said, you should use permission boundaries in order to restrict the, the, the permission of the roles created by the developers, not the developers themselves. For that, you have the identity policies, you have the service control policies, they do the job, right? And the other thing is that uh, you shouldn't actually try to replicate the policy space of the developer into the permission boundaries, right? You might find yourself running out of policy space very quickly, so instead, what you do is you categorize the different access depending on application access type, depending on a specific business use case, and define several permission boundaries category and allow the developer actually to pick the right permission boundary depending on the use case on the, or the application he's developing. What I mean by this, and just to give a concrete example, uh, I've been working, for instance, with one of my, my customers, and we work backwards from the different blueprints that they had uh, established centrally for, for instance, uh, serverless mobile applications for uh, container-based uh, web applications and define different several permission boundaries per blueprint and give the possibility to the developer to say, okay, I'm working on a container-wide, for instance, uh, application. So I'm going to pick the permission boundary that allows me uh, to access the resources that, need, that are needed by my containerized application. So here, namely, it could be a DynamoDB, an RDS instance, a Kinesis service for streaming uh, to the application, and so on and so forth. So let's see concretely how, what are the steps for uh, the configuration of permission boundaries. Well, first thing first, you create the permission boundary policy itself. Uh, and in this example, we are granting, for instance, the ability to update, uh, to update, uh, to insert and delete items in a DynamoDB and in a specific AWS region, which is uh, EU Central 1. So first thing first, we define the permission boundary policy. Okay, so here is named DynamoDB OU, uh, EU, sorry. Then you create the uh, policy for the developer that allows him to create role. However, wherever he creates role, he needs to scope down or to attach a permission boundary to that role. So this way, we are controlling or we are scoping down the uh, access rights that the uh, developer could grant to uh, a resource. A typical example here is like, I'm a developer, I have a Lambda, I need to create an execution role for my Lambda. Uh, so I want to delegate the permission for the developer to create IEM roles for his Lambda, but I want to scope it down into only the access to DynamoDB. And this is exactly what we are seeing here. And getting back to my previous example, remember here is showing just the ability to attach one permission boundary. Uh, if you think about the categorization of different uh, permission boundaries, you may also want to allow uh, the user, and you have actually the ability to allow the developer uh, to pick from different permission boundaries. So this one has only one defined, but you can have multiple one, and allow the developer to pick the right one and to attach it to the IAM role, depending on the use case he's working on. So we want to touch a little bit on DR strategies and resiliency and how we think um, about AWS Identity Center. And so Identity Center is a regional service. Uh, it's deployed in 21 regions globally, and we keep adding more regions as, as we go. Um, but it is a single region service right now. So it, it's a, a highly available across multiple availability zones. And we really focus on 
making sure it's resilient, operational, uh, and can scale to the needs of your user uh, population and application requirements. Uh, but as we think about the different DR scenarios, the intent here is really about what happens in the event that identity center becomes inaccessible in that region. Uh, how can you access your applications in that region? And here we're assuming that there's not a problem with your identity provider either, that they're active, the applications are active, but there's an issue uh, where you can't log in uh, and gain access through identity center. So we have a scenario where in this case, you can, uh, we recommend that you have a, what we call a break glass scenario. This is something where you can federate into IAM, uh, but a very limited scope number of users and operators that can then uh, go in and assume multi-account roles. Again, very scoped down, limited roles for you to be able to have access to the console to do the things you need to do during a recovery period. So uh, it, it's a strategy that we recommend. We'll go into some more details here. Um, and DJ, you got this part? Thank you. So uh, let's drill down a little bit into uh, how do you uh, implement this. So you have the IDP uh, on one side and we have the uh, designated like uh, designated brick glass uh, AWS account. In the, on the AWS side, you're going to configure actually the uh, IEM role that's going to be assumed by the federated user in the brick glass account. And in the AWS target account, you're going to configure actually the uh, roles that are going to be assumed uh, and that have the trust policy that actually uh, allow cross account role. So basically the user is gonna uh, land into the Briglass account and from the Briglass account, he's gonna uh, assume role in the target account. Um, from the IDP side, uh, you will configure the, uh, and obviously on the AWS side, as mentioned by Steve, you will also configure the IAM external identity provider in that specific account. And on the IDP uh, side, you're going to configure the SAML uh, application in order to enable the federation uh, into AWS. Keep that SAML application deactivated. You don't want to actually allow this access method in nominal situation. It's again a brick glass mode where uh, if you, you are experiencing uh, disruption, we are in the recovery phase, so you don't want to allow uh, this access. You pre-populate the groups actually in the IDP side that's going to be matched into the AWS IAM roles, but you don't put users in it, in them, right? So what happens in the failover when you are experiencing a disruption? So basically you have an internal uh, workflow internally for the users to request the access for the one that need it. Uh, once this is validated, you add the users into the group, into the IDP, and you activate the SAML application. So this way, the users will be able to uh, actually uh, assume role in the Briglass account and go to the target account from there. If things goes back and uh, you are recovered, obviously you test that actually you did recover and the nominal workflow is working. And once that's done, you ask all the users to log out from this, uh, for, from this workflow. And uh, you actually deactivate, remove the users from the group and deactivate the SAML application. So this way, you're making sure that the user will not still carry that access once you are back to normal, right? So that's one scenario. Uh, now what if the IDP is experiencing a disruption itself? Uh, so the ID here, just like we saw in the uh, previous one with the uh, identity uh, center uh, disruption, uh, the identity here and the assumption here is that IEM service is still available. So you're gonna fall back into IEM created users. Those are users created in AWS in a specific account. Again, here you pre-provision the roles that are gonna be assumed in the target account. And again, this is something that you need to figure out. Should it be the whole organization? Should it be some targeted account, a specific OU? Well, the more you scope it down, the better it is. Uh, because again, here we are in a degraded mode and we are in a brick glass mode, right? Um, so you have those users, you rely on them in order to grant the access in case of the IDP is not available. Uh, those users are prov uh, provisioned with the credentials being deactivated. So which means that 
you cannot use them, right? Uh, so uh, when you are failing over, what happens? So two possibilities, either you are vaulting the credentials of those users somewhere, just make sure that you have a procedure to regularly rotate them. Second option, actually uh, preferred one, uh, if you ask me, uh, is actually to involve the root account, make sure that you deactivate the SCP that doesn't allow a root account if you have so, uh, but you involve the root account, you actually activate the credentials of those users and you rotate them and you do it only on, again, uh, per request basis. So the idea is not to activate the whole users or try to replicate the whole users, is really to do it on a need basis, right? If the users need the access, they go to the workflow, we validate, we involve the root account, we activate the credentials and generate a new, way, new one. We assign an MFA to those local users and handed, the, uh, over, uh, handed them over to the users, right? So they can carry the access during the disruption. Back to normal, uh, you just as, uh, just as this uh, previous uh, workflow, we ask the user to log off uh, and we deactivate back the credentials of the users. So it means that those local accounts could not be used anymore. All right. So uh, today we were really you know, focused on how to scale identities with the Houston Identity Center. Um, but there's a whole host of identity services that we have that really kind of help tell that story, right? Around things like governance and least privilege with things like control tower and organizations. Uh, I am an identity center for your managing your identities within AWS as well as access to resources, uh, resource sharing with, with RAM, and then on the uh, customer facing side, our Cognito services that allow you to enable uh, customer experience for your applications. So uh, we appreciate you taking the time to listen with us today. Uh, and uh, I don't know if we have time for, for questions, uh, but uh, thank you very much. Yeah, we can take them off yeah. the stage uh, yeah. after the session. Great, yeah. thank you. Thank you.